Hey folks, welcome into the Cam Rogers Show on this Friday morning. It's episode 75. Pop a drink and celebrate with me. I'm Cam Rogers. Check me out on Twitter at MrRogers99. We are presented by AutoList here today. I've got you covered for the next hour. So much to break down. I've got all of the NFL headlines that you need to know this morning. Here's the lineup for today. So there you see it, NFL headlines, including the details surrounding Aqib Tlaib. Yes, he is going to the LA Rams. Can't be official until March 14th, of course, but it is a done deal. I'll break it all down in a matter of seconds here. Talk a little bit about Richard Sherman as well. At the 30-minute mark, Bleacher Report bracketologist Carrie Miller will join me. A little breakdown of all the NCAA March Madness storylines and then Potential teens for LeBron James this summer. I've got some interesting Vegas odds to get through. And then a final word, I'll tell you why the Rams will be a top seed by the time the 2018 playoffs come around. You're watching the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. Once again, check me out on Twitter at MrRogers99. We are presented by AutoList. Head on to AutoList.com to literally shorten your car search. It is a fantastic way to see a beautiful listing of used cars and new cars that you will certainly love to take a look at. It saves you so much time going to the dealership and all that. It's a waste of time, actually. Autolist.com is the way to go. Get their award-winning app as well for Android and iPhone users today. Autolist, sponsoring episode 75 of the Cam Rogers Show. We're so happy that they're coming along for the ride. All right, latest NFL headlines. Let's start things off with the bombshell that came out last night. Aqib Tlaib is headed to Hollywood. He's going to play for the LA Rams. That will become official on March 14th when the new league year begins. So the Rams have been quite active. Am I wrong about that one? So the deal about Aqib Tlaib, we've been hearing reports for weeks now about where he could be headed. There was talk that the 49ers were looking into Tlaib. There was talk that maybe he wanted to go back to New England and reunite with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady and company. And reports suggested that Tlaib preferred New England because of Belichick and the Los Angeles Rams because of, well, his former defensive coordinator out there in Denver in Wade Phillips. He is now the DC for LA. So Tlaib, a five-time Pro Bowler, can still play at a high level. The only problem about Tlaib with the Broncos is, or was now, he's not very cheap. And Denver had to make some difficult roster decisions to be able to make a run at Kirk Cousins. There you see Tlaib is owed $12 million in 2018, $8 million in 2019. Meanwhile, the Rams, oh my goodness, what is going on in L.A.? We're talking Aaron Donald on that front line, Mark Barron on that second level. Then you got LaMarcus Joyner at safety. He's got the franchise tag. John Johnson had a great campaign in his rookie season a year ago. Marcus Peters is coming on over from Kansas City. Insert Aqib Tlaib in that secondary too. And there is reason to believe that the LA Rams coming off a season where they were the number one scoring offense will be a top seed once the 2018 playoffs come around. Unbelievable stuff. And I ask this, which team is the favorite in the NFC West? Are the Rams now the favorite to win the division? Or maybe they always have been in your eyes. I mean, of course, they did win the division last year. Perhaps they're even bigger favorites now. Or maybe you're still buying into the San Francisco 49er hype with the big-time contract that Jimmy Garoppolo got. And then you, of course, have... Pierre Garçon coming back from injury, and the 49ers are likely to be very active in free agency because of the amount of salary cap space that they have. But for the Los Angeles Rams, they are seriously going to be a force next season. I'll talk more about them at the end of the show and tell you why I think they're going to be a really tough out in the NFC West and in the NFL in general. Meanwhile, for Denver... I'll talk a little bit more about Chris Harris Jr. He is going to stay in that secondary. I'll get to that headline later in the show. Staying in the secondary, though, Richard Sherman. Reports suggest that he is expected to be cut today by the Seattle Seahawks. This coming from the Seattle Times. So we will likely have some sort of breaking news here today about Richard Sherman being cut. And this is very much expected. 
falls in line with an early report that Sherman would be released in the coming days, that coming from NFL Network a couple of days ago. And it's unexpected because the Seahawks are in one of the worst salary cap situations. And it's unsurprising that Richard Sherman is going to get cut because the Seahawks would save $11 million off their salary cap. And oh, by the way, Richard Sherman coming off an Achilles injury. So the Seattle Seahawks are going through a defensive turnover, if you will. And Sherman could still theoretically come back at a lesser salary, but I think that's unlikely and quite frankly, awkward. Because Richard Sherman is representing himself throughout all of these negotiations. He doesn't have an agent, guys. So he has to go into the front office and talk with the Seattle Seahawks brass here and say, oh yeah, I don't deserve a pay cut. I'm still a good player. Meanwhile, the other side of the table is saying, well, we kind of believe that you should get paid less or else we're going to release you. So it's just not very good. And look, even if Richard Sherman were to take the pay cut, I feel like there would still be a sour taste in his mouth after the fact and probably wouldn't be good for Richard Sherman, Seattle Seahawks relations going forward. So in more turnover, too, I'm hearing the Seahawks are expected to cut Jeremy Lane, a cornerback as well, which would save $4.75 million off the cap. So you see DeMarco Murray. He's going to get cut as well. So Murray is due to make $6.5 million in 2018. Again, this is hardly surprising. Back-to-back, -back, hardly surprising situations here. With Richard Sherman expected to be cut, DeMarco Murray, he is a sure thing. This went down, so the Titans save a nice chunk of change here by releasing DeMarco Murray because there is no dead money involved. So Murray was due to make $6.5 million in 2018. The Titans saved that amount by cutting him. So here is what Titans general manager John Robinson said in a recent statement about DeMarco Murray. Quote, I want to thank DeMarco for his contributions as a Titan, not only for what he did on the field, but also in the locker room and in the community. He was a pro in every facet, and we wish him and his family the best moving forward. That's Titans general manager John Robinson there. And DeMarco said back in January, he's very confident he can be a lead back in the National Football League. But here's the problem. He hit that 30-year-old mark, and... I think we all know what can happen when that occurs as a running back. Your production drops off a little bit, and we saw that in the evidence. His production dropped off in terms of yards per carry from 4.4 to 3.6 from 2016 to 2017. Perhaps he goes to a Seahawks or 49ers, a couple of running back needy teams out there. I'm just not so sure he can be a three down back in the NFL. Now, Murray is the only NFL player with 4,000-plus rushing yards, 30-plus rushing touchdowns since 2014. But it's clear that he's slowing down a bit, and I think the Titans realized that last year as they started to usher in Derrick Henry a little more and usher out DeMarco Murray. Last season, Murray had 106, 176 carries for 744 yards and five touchdowns. He's a free agent. He is now searching for his next destination. Speaking of running backs, I am hearing that Saquon Barkley could go number one overall in the 2018 NFL Draft, and Vegas has now weighed in. Vegas favors Barkley to be the number one overall pick going to the Cleveland Browns. He's the favorite at plus 170, meaning a $100 bet on Saquon Barkley going first overall would result in a basically $170 payoff. You see Sam Darnold there as well, plus 240. Josh Allen at plus 400. Mayfield at plus 550. Also, Rosen is plus 700. Not a lot of faith by Vegas in terms of Josh Rosen going number one overall. It's kind of surprising there, although he didn't have a great combine. How about this one? If you're really feeling like gambling, the odds of any player other than Barkley and the four quarterbacks I mentioned going first overall is plus 1,500. So we're talking no Allen, no Mayfield, no Rosen, no uh, Darnold, no Barkley. Somebody else, apparently. Bradley Chubb, number one overall. Uh, the odds of that going down, plus 1,500. By the way, 
those odds roughly translate to a 33% chance of Barkley going first overall, 23% chance for Darnold, 17 for Allen, down to 14 for Mayfield, 10% for Rosen, and a minuscule 3% for any other player. So Saquon Barkley could perhaps go number one overall in the 2018 NFL Draft. Vegas certainly thinks so. All right, next headline here. Tom Brady shaved his head for a good cause. And we have a nice little picture to show you as well. So Brady, of course, not a great February because of the Super Bowl loss, but he is kicking off March in a really great way. Raised $7.5 million for cancer research, benefits the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker was in attendance as well. So Tom Brady, we have the picture for you, shaving his head for a cause. And I think, I want to say he has done this before just from a stylistic standpoint. Like, he has shaved his head out of choice. My producer, Harris Rubenstein, host of the Patriots Report, is confirming that. So we have seen the locks of Tom Brady from like the 2009 season. We've also seen the shaved head as well. So Tom Brady with a nice little touch there by uh, benefiting the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, raising $7.5 million for cancer research. There you see it's very close to his heart as well. His mom was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2016. All right, let's get to the next headline here. And this one is something that we have seen before. Darius Geis this time has been the victim of really weird questioning at the NFL Combine. So the NFL has launched an investigation after a team at the Combine reportedly asked Darius Geis if he likes men. You can't make this stuff up, folks. An NFL spokesperson, Brian McCarthy, released a statement saying, quote, we are looking into the matter. A question such as that is completely inappropriate and wholly contrary to league workplace policies. And Geis revealed this information on a Sirius XM interview this week saying how teams will ask uncomfortable questions to test a player's reaction. He also referenced how one team asked if his mom sells herself. Like, what? This is part of the combine culture? And another report came out, and this one is very much understandable, but also kind of falls in line with this trying to throw you off theme. Baker Mayfield, walking in and interviewing with John Dorsey, GM of the Browns, was reportedly asked about the arrest right off the bat. So, of course, when he got arrested when he was a student at Oklahoma, that one is definitely more understandable than what Darius Geis was asked because it's just way out of line. And, you know, we've seen this before with Eli Apple. He went through a similar situation in 2016. So there clearly is some sort of pattern with all of this. And the NFL also said back then with Eli Apple that they were going to look into the matter and nothing really came out of it other than an apology. So it'll be interesting to see if there's more action by way of the NFL this go around in terms of punishment or some sort of change because I think it has to happen. So Darius Geis going through some of that questioning and it looked like he wasn't too affected by it in his interview with SiriusXM. He kind of mentioned it matter-of-factly, but obviously the NFL should investigate this and see what happens from there. All right, next headline and it's an update on Jarvis Landry. Wide receiver for the Dolphins. He has officially signed the franchise tender worth $15.9 million. And at least until the Dolphins trade him, he will be earning that much money. So the general understanding was Landry would accept the tag and not fight it at all. That was kind of the general reporting out there. So this is hardly surprising news. But obviously, it is one step in the direction of Jarvis Landry being traded to another team out there. And reports obviously indicated that Landry got permission from the Miami Dolphins leadership to go out and seek and facilitate an NFL trade with him involved. And again, a trade can become official once the new league year begins on March 14th. The Miami Herald has reported that no trade is imminent, but there are plenty of wide receiver needy teams out there, such as the Ravens, such as the Bears, and 
Landry, I think, guys, is going to be one of the more fascinating off-season NFL storylines, especially at the wide receiver position. Him and Allen Robinson included. So Allen Robinson did not get the franchise tag. He's going to test the open market, so he's more of a free agency kind of side of things. But for Jarvis Landry, he's more of the trade side of things, which I think is going to be very interesting. And so with that, I do have some teams to monitor that could perhaps grab Jarvis Landry. I'm going to count you down here. I'm going to start off with the Buffalo Bills. And everybody in the comments section will probably scream at me, there's no way the Miami Dolphins will, will trade within the AFC East. Look, guys, I totally get it, but the Buffalo Bills have the trade capital to lure the Dolphins, maybe, to trade away Jarvis Landry. Buffalo, obviously, in need of a top-tier wide receiver. We'll see what Kelvin Benjamin can do next season, but last year, their top wide receiver was Deontay Thompson. That's a major yikes for me. And I think Jarvis Landry would be a fantastic complement to Kelvin Benjamin. So watch out for the Buffalo Bills in the Jarvis Landry sweepstakes. Jarvis Landry, could he head to the San Francisco 49ers? We know wide receiver is a need for San Fran. All right, 49ers fans, pause for a second. I get it. You have Trent Taylor in the slot. He's a good player, showed some fine flashes in 2017. But if you have the opportunity to acquire Jarvis Landry, are you going to pass up on it? Because the 49ers have the salary cap space to eat up Landry's contract, and Landry obviously won't be cheap for many of these teams. But still, the Niners can afford him, and the Niners could also trade away a third-round pick, which is around the range of Landry's value. That's my baseline for Jarvis in terms of trades. It's probably a third-round pick. So San Francisco 49ers, a team to monitor for Jarvis. Let's check in with the Cleveland Browns. They're going to be in the hunt for many teams, or many players, I should say, out there, including Kirk Cousins, perhaps Allen Robinson, too. Look, if Cleveland gets Cousins and Jarvis Landry, I think that connection would be very, very solid. And oh, by the way, you got Josh Gordon on the outside. But let's say Cleveland goes ahead and drafts a Sam Darnold or a Baker Mayfield or Josh Rosen, whatever the case may be. Jarvis Landry would be a fantastic compliment for a rookie quarterback because what do rookie quarterbacks like they like safety nets they like their security blankets they like their tight ends but they also like catch guzzlers if you will like Jarvis Landry who can catch over 114 or 110 receptions in a season so he would be the perfect wide receiver for a rookie quarterback if the Browns go ahead and get him and my understanding is he's not the priority for Cleveland I know the Browns would like to grab Kirk Cousins, but I think they also feel that they're out of the Cousins sweepstakes. I think they're focusing on the draft and getting Barkley at number one, perhaps a Darnold at number four, and then going from there. But maybe they could be involved in this Jarvis Landry type of sweepstakes too. We'll see. They're on my list here. Let's go to number two, the Chicago Bears. They need a wide receiver desperately, desperately. And I think Jarvis Landry would be a very nice fit for Mitchell Trubisky. Trubisky is a kind of an intermediate type of passer, short passer. Very accurate at that and would really fit well with how Landry plays the wide receiver position. So for the Chicago Bears, can you tell me a wide receiver on their roster that is actually good? Outside of Cam Meredith, I have faith in Cam Meredith as a good wide receiver. But you can't just rely on him to be the top guy for the Chicago Bears at that position because you look at last season. Dontrell Inman wasn't very good. Kendall Wright wasn't good. He's an impending free agent. Josh Bellamy is an impending free agent. Is Kevin White ever going to see the football field again? So for Chicago, I think they bypass on Calvin Ridley in the draft. They decide to go elsewhere in the draft and then go ahead and acquire Jarvis Landry via the draft or at least try to go out and grab him. So Chicago checks in as my number two team. My number one team for wide receiver Jarvis Landry the Baltimore Ravens. Why is that? Joe Flacco loves his checkdowns. I talked about how rookie quarterbacks love their security blankets. So does Flacco. For years, he had Ray Rice. For years, he had Steve Smith. For years, he had Todd Heap and Dennis Pitta when he wasn't hurt. Well, maybe in 2018, it's Jarvis Landry. And the Ravens are going to have to make some salary cap casualties and cuts to kind of free up some salary cap space, maybe 
Jeremy Macklin, Ladarius Webb, etc. But still, I like the Baltimore Ravens as a team to monitor that could go out and grab Jarvis Landry. All right, let's go through some more headlines here. A little quicker fashion. Ryan Fitzpatrick, the gunslinger himself, back with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yes, according to Ian Rappaport, the Bucs are expected to bring back Fitzmagic. Yes, Fitzmagic. He started three games last year, went two and one in replacement for Jameis Winston because Winston had that AC joint injury last year. There you see the stat line for Fitzpatrick. Seven touchdowns, three interceptions, over 1,000 yards passing. I think it's a good move for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just in terms of an insurance standpoint because you never really know with Jameis Winston. So Ryan Fitzpatrick coming back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Nice little play there. Zeke Elliott, he is thanking Jerry Jones for Jones's support. He actually took two Twitter yesterday to say thank you to Jerry. Of course, Jones paid a little over $2 million in legal fees to the NFL related to the Ezekiel Elliott suspension. There is the tweet. Much love and thanks to Mr. Jones for standing behind me as he does for all his players. Great appreciation. Time to move on and look forward to a great season in 2018. By the way, why do I feel this whole ordeal with Roger Goodell basically finding but not finding Jerry Jones was him trying to get back at Jerry for Jones's apparent effort to like find a successor to Roger Goodell like do we remember when that report came out I have a feeling Roger Goodell is still a little salty a little salt going on right now with old Raj and maybe that's why he wanted to find but not find but really fine Jerry Jones the two million dollars in legal fees because remember, this whole Ezekiel Elliott situation dragged on forever. And so Ezekiel Elliott certainly showing his appreciation for Jerry Jones there. Let's get to the next headline here. So Marquise Goodwin, extension for the San Francisco 49ers. It's a three-year extension worth $20.3 million, $10 million of that guaranteed. I think it's a nice move. So a lot of people like to say that the 49ers have a need at wide receiver, and I understand that, but Marquise Goodwin was very, very solid a year ago, and they've been tied to Allen Robinson quite often, but this extension here for Goodwin kind of indicates to me that, like, John Lynch is saying to himself, hey, we like our wide receiving core. We don't want to, like, sell out for perhaps uh, Allen Robinson or Jarvis Landry or anything like that. So you see the stat line in 2017, 56 receptions, 962 yards, two touchdowns. And the hype is real for San Francisco. Are the 49ers Super Bowl contenders? Let me know. Hit that heart for yes. Give me a like if you're just saying, whoa, easy on the, the uh, Super Bowl train there, Cam Rogers. I'm throwing out my like on that one. Let me know here on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. If you're on YouTube, Hit that heart or like in the comment section below. We certainly appreciate your participation. And I'm watching the broadcast on my laptop right now, getting some hearts, getting some likes flowing in. I'm getting great comments too. Breton chiming in. Emmanuel, thanks so much for watching the show. Matt Elliott, appreciate that. Dean, watching the show as well. So we certainly... Uh, Always appreciate the support that flows in for the Cam Rogers show. Hit that reaction, though. Heart for yes and a like for no in terms of the 49ers. So, I talked about Chris Harris Jr. at the top of the show. He's going to remain in Denver. So, the Broncos exercised their option on Chris Harris. So, this makes sense to me. The big storyline with Denver was they weren't going to be able to afford all three of their cornerbacks in a keep to leave Harris Jr. and Bradley Roby. So they had to make a decision. Obviously, that decision was to trade to leave, bring back Harris Jr. And it's a $1.1 million payout ahead of Chris Harris Jr.'s $7.4 million salary for 2018. Harris has played every game for the Broncos over the last five seasons. So a nice veteran option there. And a guy that People don't really talk about, but he is a really, really solid corner. So good signing there for Denver, or I guess option, if you will. Chris Harris returning to the Mile High Stadium. All right, let's get to the next headline here. Jonathan Stewart is a free man because the Carolina Panthers cut him. He recently visited the Seattle Seahawks. In fact, it was yesterday that he was in the area. And 
the Seahawks are a team that's just trying to find a running back. Like, they have no run game whatsoever, and it's pretty brutal to see. So if Jonathan Stewart signs with the Seahawks, he will be joining a crowded backfield, including the following players. Chris Carson, C.J. Proceis, Mike Davis, Thomas Rawls, and J.D. McKissick. None of those players topped 240 yards last season. So you're telling me that the Seahawks are kind of desperate for a running back? Jonathan Stewart, by the way, from the Seattle area. He is coming off one of his worst campaigns, though, rushing for just 680 yards at a career-low 3.4 yards per carry. You really have to wonder if there's anything left in the tank here for Jonathan Stewart. Kind of a DeMarco Murray-type situation, although it's much more dire for Jonathan Stewart. He's older than DeMarco. So that's the latest with Jay Stu. What's the deal with Baker Mayfield? So he's got a few visits coming up, folks. He will be visiting with the Browns, the Giants, and the Jets. I think Big Apple Baker could be a thing, folks. In fact, there's a two out of three chance for that to happen, according to the three visits that are coming up, talking about the Jets and the Giants. So, hey, who knows? Official visits with the Jets and Giants, as well as the Browns, and all of them, of course, have picks inside the top 10. The Browns have two picks inside the top five, and they could explore Baker Mayfield maybe at number four overall. The Dolphins and the Saints have made the same arrangements in terms of private workouts. So the Jets and Browns will be holding private workouts with Mayfield. The Dolphins and Saints will be doing the same, and the workouts will take place after Oklahoma's March 14th Pro Day. So Mayfield visiting with the Browns, Giants, and Jets. He's got private workouts coming up with the Jets, Browns, Dolphins, and Saints. Dolphins picking at number 11 overall. The Saints are way down there, so they're going to have to like trade up or something if they want to pray for Baker Mayfield to be drafted. Uh, but we'll see what happens. He's got some visits coming up, and it'll be interesting to monitor as we go forward toward the NFL draft. All right, Le'Veon Bell. So is he going to sit out the regular season? So he is not going to sit out in 2018 during the regular season. However, he does plan to skip off-season workouts. So yeah, with the Steelers exercising the franchise tag and no real deal in sight, Le'Veon Bell is planning on not showing up to OTAs or training camp or anything like that, team meetings, etc. He recently said, quote, I'm going to be in the facility week one. It's going to be a rerun of last year. I'm not going to training camp. I'm not doing anything else. OTAs, anything extra, nothing like that. So the more this drags on, the more, it, more, the more worse it gets for relations between Bell and the Steelers front office. So let me know in the comments section. I'm watching my broadcast on my laptop. Like I said, should Le'Veon Bell sit out? the entire off season because that is his plan. Does not want to show up to OTAs or training camp or anything like that. Should that make sense to you? I mean, should that go down? Let me know in the comments section here on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. And you may recall when Le'Veon Bell returned for the regular season last year, he kind of struggled. And it was a slow start, and that's expected when you sit out the entire freaking offseason, Le'Veon. So, look, if the Steelers' leadership is smart, they got to find a way to work out a long-term deal with this guy. Le'Veon Bell is a top three running back in the National Football League. He wants to get paid like an RB number one, and perhaps there's an argument to be made that he should. But if the Steelers are smart about this, they got to figure it out, because this can't turn into a Kirk Cousins type of ordeal where it's franchise tag after franchise tag after franchise tag and you just wear away your relations with that particular player. And I honestly don't even know if Redskins fans are actually sad about Kirk Cousins leaving because it, it's almost like a sense that they didn't feel like they even knew him, you know, because it was Kirk Cousins, you know, perhaps going into free agency, and then perhaps not, and then perhaps he is, and all of this stuff. So Le'Veon Bell, he plans on returning for the regular season, Steelers fans, so don't worry about that, but he does plan on sitting out the off-season workouts. Last headline to get through here. 
Mohamed Wilkerson, what is the latest on him? So he was released by the Jets after a dismal 2017 season where he got benched in week 15 after a result of, as a result of missing a team meeting or something like that. So Mohamed Wilkerson is a free man. He visited the Packers yesterday. He has visits with the Saints and Chiefs up next. So he wrapped up a visit with the Packers. That's an interesting one at that. I think the Saints and Chiefs will be an interesting option as well. Green Bay, I think, is the most likely because Mike Pettin is the defensive coordinator out there. And Pettin, of course, worked with Wilkerson in 2011 and 2012. Wilkerson will have to do some convincing, by the way, as he goes through this tour with all these teams out there, trying to convince people that, uh, yeah, my maturity is okay, you know, ignore 2017, that's not who I am kind of thing, because if you miss a team meeting, it doesn't look very good on you as a professional, because these guys are professionals after all, they're getting paid to play the National Football League, play in this league. So that's the latest with Mohamed Wilkerson. Those are your NFL headlines this morning. You're watching the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. I am Cam Rogers. Check me out on Twitter, at Mr. Rogers 99 Ladies and gentlemen, it is March. It mean, that means it's March Madness season. We're talking about bubble teams. We're talking about bracketology and all of that great stuff. And I have one of the best in the business joining me on the program right now, Carrie Miller, Bleacher Report bracketologist on the line right now. Carrie, you're a busy man. I do appreciate you taking the time. Let's get into it right here, right now, sir. I want to talk about some of the bubble teams that you talked about uh, in your recent article out there. And, you know, at this point, it's a projection kind of time, right? Because Selection Sunday is coming out and we're all looking forward to who gets in and who doesn't get in and all that jazz. So, Carrie, let's start off with your first four in, and I want to talk about Providence to kick things off here. All right. What do you want to know about Providence? Because that is the most difficult resume to evaluate, in my opinion, right now, because they have three ugly losses um, to Massachusetts, Minnesota, and DePaul. But they have excuses for all of them. You know, Minnesota was a top 15 team at the time of that loss to the Golden Gophers, and then they fell apart. And in the losses to Massachusetts and DePaul, they were without key players due to either injury or illness. So they, you know, the Providence fans want you to, to kind of overlook those terrible losses, but they have one of the strangest resumes out there in a year where, I mean, the gap between the top number 10 seed and like the seventh team out of the field is just razor thin. I mean, usually at this point we're debating maybe five or six teams for the last spot or two in the field. And right now I feel like there are still 18 <laughs> bubble teams still in the conversation. It's pretty crazy right now. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you have, the uh, defeat of Creighton in the Big East quarterfinals. But you did mention those bad losses. UMass DePaul looks really bad as well. And, of course, lack of quality wins away from home. Let's go to another team here in your projections as the first four, go, uh, we go, as we go through your first four in here, or last four in, I should say. Arizona State Sun Devils, 20-11 uh, record so far. They started 12-0, and Kerry, and then since then they're 8-11. and What's the deal? Yeah, very similar to Oklahoma, which is the resume everyone has been talking about. A team that started out really good, got some really strong uh, wins in non-conference play, and then just completely fell apart over the last month or two. Um, Arizona State has nine losses to teams outside the projected field. Um, none of them are that terrible. I mean, they didn't lose a home game to Washington State or Oregon State, but... All the same, they didn't beat Arizona. Um, I think they had home wins over UCLA and USC, both of which are bubble teams. And that's about it for the last two months. But they have those two wins uh, back in non-conference play at Kansas and on a neutral court against Xavier, both of which are projected number one seeds right now. So it's, right. it's hard to say they don't belong in um, based on what they were early in the season and based on their overall resume. But just looking at them right now what they have shown us over the last 19 games it's almost preposterous to say that they're a tournament team so 
Uh, they're they're a really tough call right now. Like you said, I have them in my last four in, um, and I, I gave them a, a pretty hard look last night. Um, I had them as my last team in and actually scrubbed them up a little bit to third to last in. So I feel a little bit better about them uh, than I did right after the loss to Colorado in the Pac-12 tournament. But it's still going to be a, a sweaty ride to Selection Sunday for Bobby Hurley and company. Bleacher Report bracketologist Kerry Miller on the line talking about his last four in for the NCAA tournament. So we just talked about Arizona State. Let's talk about Marquette here. So lost to Villanova in the Big East tournament. Swept Creighton and Seton Hall, though. What do we make of the Golden Eagles? Yeah, and that's about all that they did. Um, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago before they lost to DePaul um, in, in late February. I felt pretty good about Marquette. I think I had them as a 10 seed at the time. Most people didn't have them in, and I got a lot of flack on, on Twitter for, for having Marquette that comfortably in the field, but you know, the more I look at them, the more I think I, I may have been wrong. I, I've been gradually moving them down, um, not because of the loss to Villanova. That did nothing to hurt them, even though it was pretty ugly they got blown out but a neutral court loss to Villanova does nothing to hurt your resume that's just a missed opportunity but yeah aside from sweeping Creighton and Seton Hall uh, there's not a whole lot there and both of those teams have kind of slid backwards in the last uh, few weeks which is why you know Marquette's resume has gotten a little less enticing during that time. And there's Marquette checking in there. And your final team into the field here, Kerry, you've got the UCLA Bruins. 21-10 and 10, beat Stanford in the Pac-12 quarterfinals. And look, the Pac-12, there's a scenario, Kerry, where, where like not a lot of these teams are going to be well represented or the Pac-12 won't be well represented in the tournament. Maybe UCLA can kind of help things. What do you make of them? Yeah, UCLA, I had them first team out until I was scrubbing over the field last night and realized how ugly uh, Louisville's <laughs> resume actually is and then ended up just bumping up UCLA almost by default. Uh, I know a lot of people have them in the, the last four in or maybe just above that as an 11 seed, but they had a, a road win over Arizona and a neutral court win over uh, Kentucky. They also swept USC. That's four pretty good wins for a team that we're talking about right on the bubble, especially compared to, you know, a team like Marquette that we were just discussing that just has uh, four wins against kind of bubble teams. So I think I'll probably end up moving up UCLA even a little more, um, especially if they're able to beat Arizona today. That would absolutely lock them in. But even with a loss, I think UCLA will probably get in because they're looking a little better every time I look at them. UCLA on the upward trend. Meanwhile, Louisville on the downward trend, Carrie. You have them in your first six out. So we'll talk about some of these teams here. And Louisville, 5-13 and 13 versus Quadrants 1-2. and two. What's the deal? Yeah, and none of those wins are that good. I actually looked at it this morning. Uh, they are 0-11 against the RPI Top 50, which Ooh. if we were using last year's buckets – on the team sheets, you'd be throwing out Louisville right away. 0 and 11 is terrible. I mean, their their quadrant one and quadrant two wins are against Florida State, Virginia Tech, and Notre Dame, I believe. So they have three road wins against teams in the 50 to 75 range, which counts as a quadrant one win this year, which looks better than it would have looked yet last year. But still, those aren't that great of wins. I think the the main thing holding up Louisville right now or Bowie and them, whatever you want to say is that they, they don't have any terrible losses. I don't think they have a loss to a team outside the RPI top 65, but teams with no great wins and no bad losses usually end up getting left out. I think that's where the Cardinals are headed. All right, let's talk about the next team. Second team here in your first six out the middle Tennessee blue Raiders, and they're hoping for Dayton for the second time in six years. They lost to Southern Miss in the Conference USA quarterfinal, so that's going to hurt their chances, right, Kerry? Yeah, that was a brutal loss for them. I had them, if they had won the Conference USA tournament, I think they would have been a 9 seed, maybe a 10, but now I don't see them getting in. Um, if they had lost to a better team in the Conference USA tournament, they'd be in, in good shape right now. If they had gotten to the 
even to the semifinals and lost to it like an old dominion or a western kentucky it wouldn't be that bad but southern miss is an awful loss i think they're 220 somewhere in that range in the rpi and they entered the tournament having just lost uh they being middle tennessee having just lost their uh worst game of the season at home against marshall so now even though the committee doesn't you know explicitly look at most recent results they look at the whole resume it's not good that their two worst losses of the season have come in their last two games i think that's going to really hurt their their eye test which is something that we tend to talk about more with mid-major teams right let's go to the next team on your line here carrie we've got the saint mary's gales they got that excellent road win over gonzaga but here's the problem losses to san francisco and washington state do not look very good yeah and even though the uh the road loss or the road win to uh over BYU is now a quadrant one win um, because they lost to BYU in the West Coast Conference Tournament. Kind of a weird situation there where they helped their quadrant one record by suffering a quadrant two loss. But overall, that that hurts them. Um, they lost to BYU. They lost on a neutral court to Georgia. So four of their five losses are to non-tournament teams, like teams – Unless Georgia beats Kentucky today and goes on, you know, a ridiculous run in the SEC tournament, right. they have four losses to teams that have no business being in the NCAA tournament and just that one really nice win over Gonzaga. And I don't think that's a very good balance for a team that deliberately did not schedule well in non-conference play for the umpteenth consecutive year. All right, let's get into some of these teams that are big-time long shots, but worthy of discussion here. The Baylor Bears lost to West Virginia in the Big 12 quarterfinals. They got the good wins over Kansas and Texas Tech, but 14 losses and a not-so-great non-conference schedule I think is going to hurt them, right? Yeah, I think that's that's what we're looking at for the, the non-conference schedule. They played seven home games against quadrant four and a non-division one game um i forget who that was against but that game doesn't matter um so they really didn't do much of anything outside of the conference and then they went eight and ten in conference play um not that conference record really matters to the selection committee but combining it with a pretty weak non-conference schedule that's not a good look for the bears even though they do have those two really good home wins over Kansas and Texas Tech. I think if they had beaten West Virginia last night, they'd be pretty comfortably in. But without that win, I think they're going to miss the tournament. And the Baylor Bears with an early exit out of their conference tournament. The same can be said about the Syracuse Orange. They lost to UNC in the ACC tournament, Carrie. And imagine if they beat UNC, they probably would have a much better chance to get inside the field, at least according to your projections. But here we are, and they're not playing any more basketball. They're going to sweat it out. Yeah, every year it seems we're we're debating Syracuse heading into Selection Sunday. I believe this is the the third straight year they've either been you know first last four in or first four out. I mean they're they're always right on that bubble somehow. But yeah, losing to North Carolina and they not that it really matters how they looked in that game, but they didn't look very good. Um, they have a couple of bad losses to Wake Forest, Boston College, and Georgia Tech, and really didn't do that much in the wins column, aside from a home win over Clemson at the end of the regular season. So I think they just don't have a, a strong enough balance of good wins to, to bad losses, but they did schedule pretty well in non-conference play. I believe they have a top 20 non-conference strike to schedule, so that might help them finish ahead of some of these teams like Louisville and Baylor that really didn't do much to challenge themselves until conference play began. All right, and then finally here, Kerry, you got the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. As our own Brian Ralph said here uh, on one of the articles that we have, there's no way they're getting in. There's just no way. They got the bad losses, the ball stay at Indiana, and then losing to Duke in the ACC tournament obviously hurts as well. So any chance at all for the Fighting Irish? What's funny is until ESPN started shoving Notre Dame down our throats during the ACC tournament, nobody was talking about them as a bubble team. And now everybody wants to talk about them as a team that should get in. Oh, excuse me, my alarm's going off. Um, they, they didn't do that much at full strength. We have romanticized Notre Dame just out of control. They had one 
pretty nice neutral court win over Wichita State, but they were down by like 18 in that game. They needed a miraculous comeback and a bailout foul call in the final seconds to win that game. They lost to Ball State and Indiana at full strength. Like right. the way you hear ESPN talking about Notre Dame, you'd think they were, you know, just blowing out Michigan State, Duke, and Villanova in November, but they weren't that they were outside of my projected field before Bonzi Colson got hurt. And, you know, they didn't beat anybody of value with him back in the lineup. So I I don't get it. I don't think they're anywhere close, but I'm keeping them on that bubble watch just because that way people don't have to ask me about them. Well, Kerry, of course, you got to get back to it. So I will hold to the 15 minutes I promised you. I do want to get in one more question. We have some graphics here of your number one seeds. We'll kind of flow through them here. we got the Musketeers, Jayhawks, Virginia Cavaliers, and Villanova Wildcats. Tell me which number one seed you have projected is the most dangerous, dangerous in March Madness. Oh, most dangerous? I would have to say Villanova just because, I mean, if you watched that game against Marquette last night, when they are feeling it on offense, holy crap, are they good. I mean, it, until they started losing a couple of games in February, like they were clearly the favorite to win the national championship, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think they're re-cemented as a top three team um, in that conversation. Uh, regardless of what happens the rest of the way in the Big East tournament. But I think the one team that is now the favorite that is not currently a number one seed, they're my top number two seed, is Duke. Now that they have figured things out on defense, their Grayson Allen is shooting a lot better. They're, they're just firing all cylinders at the right time. So even if they don't win the ACC tournament and end up with a one seed, I still think they are the most dangerous team in the field. Kerry Miller of Bleacher Report joining us here on the Cam Rogers Show this morning. He is going to be very busy for the weeks to come, no doubt about it. Kerry, really do appreciate you coming on the program. Wish you all the best, and we'll keep on reading. Very, very busy indeed, but it was good chatting with you. Thanks for having me on. All right, take care. And he's joining the Cam Rogers Show here today, presented by AutoList. Save yourself the time. Go on AutoList.com. That's where you can find your dream new or used car Autolist sponsoring episode 75 of the Cam Rogers Show here today. So, from college basketball to the NBA, and more specifically, LeBron James. We have updated Vegas odds in terms of where LeBron James could go in the summer of 2018, where he could sign. We'll start off with our number one team, obviously, the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Vegas odds, plus 250 for him. So... Cleveland, of course, traded away young pieces to kind of attempt to lure him back. At least that's my thinking there. And if Cleveland finds some way to win a title, and I don't know if they will this year, but if they do, that, that might just lure him to remain. And, of course, the relationship with owner Dan Gilbert is an interesting one to talk about as well. A nice little uh, nugget, too. But James has a $35.6 million player option for 2018 to 2019, according to Spotrack. He's expected to opt out of his deal this summer, but from what I am hearing and from what I am reading, re-signing with Cleveland is not out of the question. So one thing we can probably guarantee is that he will opt out of that option, but he could still come back to Cleveland with a different price tag. So the Cleveland Cavaliers check in at number one. You see the Vegas odds at plus 250. And don't worry, we'll recap in our listicle fashion as well at the end of the segment. Let's go to team number two, the LA Lakers. So a trade with the Cavs at the deadline opens up two maximum contract opportunities for hopefuls of Paul George and LeBron James, but more probably LeBron James more than anybody else. And of course, LeBron has the business interest in LA, has two houses there as well. Lonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram may very well develop into all-star caliber players too. But here's my problem with LA here. If it takes until LeBron is 37 for Ingram and Lonzo to really develop, and LeBron won't have to carry the team anymore, does it make sense for him to end his career as a Los Angeles Laker? I think the Lakers really have to impress LeBron throughout this end of the season to really get him to come to L.A. Because the argument out there, and we have some pictures of him in the uh, respective jerseys as we go through these teams, 
The argument is that LeBron probably wants to stay in the East so that he has an easier path to get to the NBA Finals, right? He doesn't have to fend off the Rockets or fend off the Warriors out West. He can get an easier path to the Finals in the Eastern Conference. So that's why people are saying maybe the Philadelphia 76ers, maybe the New York Knicks, although there was a report that came out recently that LeBron James is reportedly weighing only four teams, the Cavs, Lakers, Rockets, and 76ers, so it's no coincidence that those teams are my top four, but I do want to talk about the Knicks and Warriors just for the sake of it, just in case. You never know if his mind changes. So let's go to number three on the list here, the 76ers. This is the one I'm rooting for, and I don't know about you guys, but I think it's a very intriguing option here. Not a ton of money on the books, but lots of youth and shooting around them, and of course, you got the quintessential big and Joel Embiid. We know he likes Ben Simmons and James Embiid and Ben Simmons, I think would be a really fun trio out there in Philadelphia. Plus, like I said, he can stay in the Eastern Conference, which I think is something that he prioritizes. And as I go through this, this discussion here, we also kind of have to get into the mind of LeBron James and figure out what exactly his motivation is. Where does he want to go and what is the motiva motivation behind that? Does he want to win titles? Does he want to get a ton of money and then maybe he wants to join a team that's more of a project and then build it into a franchise so when he retires, you know, he has a big time legacy with that team. That's what we're guessing. And my guess is that LeBron wants to win titles. I don't think money is necessarily the number one priority. I think titles is. And so I think with the Philadelphia Six, 76ers here, there's certainly an opportunity to win a title. And it's not like it's going to be a long time project. A long time project would be the New York Knicks. All right, so I've got the 76ers checking in at number three. You got the Vegas odds of plus 500 for that to go down. This one is shocking for me for the odds, 250 for the Houston Rockets. I just don't know how it makes sense. Like from a monetary standpoint, yeah, it would be an ounce standing move, but the Western Conference would just be thrown on its head. You got LeBron or Chris Paul likely would need to take a pay cut, and I don't know if either of those players would. So if you, know, if you want to talk about the monetary kind of situation here, the Houston Rockets could get rid of everybody else on the roster, not named James Harden, without taking back any salary, and they still wouldn't have the room to shell out two maxes for 10 plus year veterans. All right, so, I mean, from a financial standpoint, it just doesn't add up. And right now with Ryan Anderson, the Rockets are on the hook for $101 million in salary for uh, 2018, 2019, or 20 million under the cap with Chris Paul unrestricted, and then Trevor uh, Ariza and Clint Capella as well, all due to become free agents. Those three come with a combined $57.7 million cap holds. Talking about uh, Chris Paul, Ariza, Capella. All right, so, I mean, it's an expensive venture for the Houston Rockets. USA Today's Sam Amick actually reported in December that some, in quote, rocket circles, whatever that means, believe Houston has a legitimate chance of signing James. But I would love for an accountant out there to provide some argument in terms of how this could actually go down. Please let me know about the Houston Rockets, but they're there at number four. Now we get into the territory of long shots. The New York Knicks, look at those Vegas odds, plus 1,600. Look, the only lure I think for this one is if LeBron wants to go to the big sports market in New York and grow his brand out there at MSG and then maybe want to turn around a franchise and turn it into something that's formidable in the Eastern Conference. That's all I have for an argument. Other than that, I really don't see a reason for LeBron James to go to the New York Knicks. And James reportedly intends to sign a maximum contract wherever he goes. So that could come with a starting salary upwards of $35 million. The Knicks are projected at $7 million over the cap. So adding other pieces to the roster would be an issue to start with, even if they do get LeBron James. So 
that's my issue with new, the uh, New York Knicks there. But they do check in at number five, a team worth mentioning. Again, they were not part of that report, though, that came out in terms of the four teams that LeBron is currently weighing. Finally, number six, the Vegas odds have them at plus 500. The Golden State Warriors, it's a pipe dream, though, guys. There's just no way. And sources told Chris Haynes of ESPN.com at the beginning of February that James would discuss things with the Warriors' leadership out there in terms of an opportunity, but it just doesn't make sense. Kind of like the Houston Rockets. It just doesn't add up, literally does not add up in terms of money. And the Warriors are expected to run right up to the salary cap as well. And here's another thing. Do the Warriors even want LeBron James? And they also likely have to sacrifice some minutes for Kevin Durant in the process if they were to get LeBron over. So the only way it would work would be the following. A sign and trade and for the salaries to match in such a deal that the Warriors would have to trade Andre Iguodala, Sean Livingston, and one of Chris Thompson or Draymond Green. So like literally what even is the point? Because if you get LeBron James, that means complete turnover of your roster, a roster that is already very darn good. So let me know, where will LeBron James play in 2018? We have a listicle recap as well with all of the potential destinations with the corresponding Vegas odds. So here we go, my top three, Cleveland Cavs, LA Lakers, Philadelphia 76ers. You see the odds towards the right of your screen. And then four through six here, the Houston Rockets, the New York Knicks, and the Golden State Warriors. Look at that number for the Knicks. Hey, if you're a betting man out there, maybe you're throwing some cash down on LeBron to go to New York, but I don't think it's very likely. You're watching the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. I am Cam Rogers. Hit me up on Twitter at Mr. Rogers 99 It's episode 75 today, sponsored by... Auto List. Head on to autolist.com. Save yourself so much time when you're looking for that dream new car or dream used car out there. Don't go to a million dealerships and go through all that process. Head on to autolist.com today and you can get that dream car. All right, folks. So we do want to remind you that you can get the podcast version of the Cam Rogers Show as well. Head on to chatsports.com slash cam show, download, subscribe, leave a review, all that good stuff. Five stars is preferred, but you can get me wherever you go. All right, a final word on the Cam Rogers show. The LA Rams, they will be a top seed in 2018. Book it, sharpie it, it's a thing. I am fully convinced that the Rams are not messing around. And it put me over the edge last night with the breaking news of Aqib Tlaib. So the Rams get Marcus Peters and Tlaib, Tlaib a five-time Pro Bowler, in the secondary. They are keeping LaMarcus Joyner thanks to the franchise tag. And then you have John Johnson as well coming off a fantastic rookie season at safety too. That is an elite secondary. Then you have that front line led by Aaron Donald, perhaps the single Biggest disruptor in the National Football League. This guy is unbelievable at defensive tackle. Out of this world player. And then you go to the offensive side. Oh, by the way, number one scoring offense in 2017. So you couple that with the fact that they have the offensive player of the year in Todd Gurley. Jared Goff had a great season. My only question mark is about Sammy Watkins. I don't know where he is headed. It looks like he probably is going to test the open market. And that means it's Robert Woods as the top receiver, but Cooper Cup could emerge as well. So there's some positivity there. You got some young tight ends for the Rams too. I think the offense will be fine as long as they predicate it off of Todd Gurley. He's the centerpiece of that offense. Jared Goff, play action off of that. Robert Woods down the field. A little Cooper Cup on the intermediate routes as well. Tell me a team outside of the Philadelphia Eagles that has a better chance to get a bye week in the 2018 NFL playoffs. Okay, maybe the Minnesota Vikings, but we don't even know who their quarterback is, so we can't even say that. We know the Rams are in a good position. We don't know about the Vikings. They're going to try to get Kirk. Maybe they go into the draft and draft one because it looks like Teddy, Case, and Sam Bradford are all on their way out. So I like the Rams a lot to be a formidable team in the 2018 NFL playoffs. Save this video. It is March 9th, 2018, 
and rewatch it in January of 2019. All right, folks, I am saying goodbye here on the Cam Rogers Show. Once again, I'm Cam Rogers. Hit me up on Twitter at Mr. Rogers 99. I've got the bracket for you on Monday morning, 10 o'clock Eastern time. Take care.